Hi folks, this is the deep learning section on the uh, Big Data Applications Analytics course, BDAA. And we're going to start off with some comments on optimization because when you learn something, you're optimizing uh, your understanding of what you're learning. And so there's always an optimization problem. In fact, as we note, uh, most things can be thought of as optimization problems. All right, so that's what it says, opt. That's the, le that's the lesson, and um, we're overview of optimization. So here are some terms which we'll discuss in the future slides. Objective function, or energy, or loss function. That's the thing that you're minimizing. Um, then we have local minima or optima. I will always use minima, as most people do in this field. Even though if you just change the sign of the function, minima returned at the maxima. So it's so you. Um, so you you can always think of things of local minima, and the classic things you're trying to minimize, which is the difference between objects. That sorry, you're trying to optimize, namely the difference between objects. That's always a minimum. Energy functions are always minima. And then we'll discuss why everything's an optimization problem with some examples. And uh, then we'll have examples of, of objective functions, greedy algorithms, how we find distances to define the difference between things, how we look at discrete and continuous parameters, and, how, and also some types of algorithms which are not deep learning, genetic algorithms, and a class of algorithms which deep learning could be, is sometimes could be considered as, which is heuristics. So that's what we're going to be doing. And let's get started. Okay, so here we have a general optimization problem. When I started doing optimization, which was unfortunately uh, um, 55 years ago, um, I used to have functions which depended on a few parameters, actually up to thousands, but typically just a few. Um, and it's, and uh, but nowadays they're up to billions, and they're going to get bigger and bigger as we more build more complicated models. And as we noted, optimization can always be thought of as a minimization. Often the things that you're um, trying to minimize can be guaranteed to be mathematically bounded below in practice positive. Uh, like if you have a sum of squares, uh, that must always be positive. There are two types of parameters, continuous parameters like centers of a cluster, the weights in a deep learning network. Uh, there you are, those associated with algorithms like expectation maximization. And they're discrete parameters such as um, is, are we at war or not, or things like that. Those are, can be our, um, how many fingers do we have on our hands? Those can be tackled by algorithms like genetic algorithms. That's also deep learning. Some of them, let me look at the methods of solving. Deep learning is characterized by actually using first derivatives. Uh, in the days before that, actually most optimization problems would just use function evaluations. And uh, some people like me used to use second derivatives. And we have expectation maximization as a general technique. Uh, the revolution that deep learning brought to us, stochastic gradient descent, and actually ordinary steepest descent, which is a variant of stochastic gradient descent, but it's not quite as clever, and it always gets stuck. And I actually never used steepest descent, uh, but I didn't know about stochastic gradient descent until recently when I saw it in the deep learning community. Uh, it turns out if you're trying to minimize a function as one variable, that's pretty easy. You can always uh, calculate the function, uh, see what the value is, uh, halve the value and see what it is, double the value, see what it is. And you can usually narrow down on the right answer pretty quickly. Um, in, in one or many dimensions, mathematically, the fastest is Newton's methods with second derivatives. But that's very, very sensitive and always diverges in the naive fashion. And I used to spend a lot of time developing non-naive versions. Um, and there's a rather subtle point that if you want a second derivative of an energy function, 
That corresponds to first derivatives of your components. And then in all problems, there is the issue of constraints. You want to make certain that you're finding minimizing x subject to y. Um, like um, if you have a web page, you're, min you're, minimi you're actually maximizing the amount of money people spend. That's minimizing the, the negative of money. Uh, but you have a constraint that you want to keep them happy. So you, you also have the constraint of maximizing happiness. Um, well, I was a physicist, and one reason I studied optimization is that most things in physics are minimization problems. Hamiltonians are minimization problems. And nature likes to minimize things. In, in equilibrium, the energy is minimized. And so there, and also physics gives you both methods to find minima, um, and also gives you uh, examples of interesting uh, loss functions with lots of uh, interesting structures. Um, and always, as we'll see, global minima are only easy to find if the energy function is simple. It has a nice simple shape. Uh, but mostly, you don't actually know whether it's simple or not. And you actually do not know whether you're at the real minimum or a fake minimum. So the energy function uh, has typically unknown number and distribution of local minima. And the global minima is very difficult to find. And one of the advantages of stochastic gradient descent, it puts some stochastics into the, uh, into the problem. And that allows it to jiggle around and, and go through these uh, false minima. Um, there are also many, what you might call application or use case specific um, algorithms. Even deep learning is use case specific because the network you use is very specific to the problem. And uh, this is, you uses this word called heuristics, which are algorithms which are justified by their practical importance and don't necessarily get the optimal answer. But they all hopefully get good answers. Um, typically, optimization is very expensive because you have, if you have a billion parameters, to try to run over a billion, all value, all possibilities in a billion is going to take you a while. And so you have to find some methodology to avoid doing that. And as I've already mentioned, the energy function is usually bounded below. So that's good. Okay, here are some little pictures, although they're called optima, they're all actually minima. Uh, although the minima also have maxima in between minima. Uh, but the interesting parts of these graphs are all minima. Here you might call a classic physics graph. A sort of single minimum with a global thing at the minima here. And lots of little sort of ragged related minima. That's so here the, the so-called um, local minima are related to the global minima. So that contrasts with this picture here, where the local minima are actually look just the same as the global minima. They're not particularly correlated with it. All that counts is how big the function is at the bottom. I should say here we're plotting the objective function in the y-axis, and the x-axis is just some metaphor, I mean, some representation of the two or one through one billion parameters which describe the system. Uh, just to show this is quite an old field, I left on the thing at the bottom, 1992. It was a talk I gave at the, uh, at the medical meeting in Houston. And you can see I was at Syracuse University. And this was um, actually before PowerPoint existed. This is done with a system called Persuasion. And so this shows that this concept of local minima and global minima, which is these pink things were done in 1990, probably actually before 92. This picture I probably used from earlier. And um, so this is not a new concept. And the strategy for dealing with it are hardly new. Now here's the world's nicest function, convex. It's a beautiful bowl shaped. It's a very, very clear derivatives in all directions. And so that's what you'd love to have. And you try to manipulate your function 
to make it look like this convex function. Here is a more realistic function with lots of minima and maxima and rolling hills. And this is, um, I mean, actually, I mean, I, I mentioned the word hills there. It, to think of just about your experience in climbing and mountains and hills and deceptive uh, local valleys. You can have a high valley, which it looks totally local, wonderful local minima, but it could be far from the real minima, which could be a much lower valley. Okay, so that's, uh, and, but we need to find automated methods that do not, uh, do not take pictures. So as I here, here if we come here, we want to get the right answer, which is here, and not the wrong answer. And here is the loss function, and um, you say it's always minimization. We always can get to a minimum. It's easier to know we're at a minimum for functions that are bounded below, because you just look at the um, derivatives around the point. They will always tend to go up. Um, and all these methods like steepest descent or stochastic gradient descent are essentially likely to go to minima, uh, especially steepest descent, which is aimed to get to a minima. Um, and these methods like steepest descent, which is a greedy algorithm, it goes in the direction which makes the most progress. It's really trying to suck it into lowering the value. Uh, it nearly, they nearly always end up in the local minima, because if you do steepest descent from here, how do you know that this isn't the right answer and you have to go over here? Very difficult. Only if you made a mistake and dashed over here first would you actually get find the uh, uh, real minima. But uh, that's not usually what you do. And uh, stochastic gradient descent is trying to wobble around here so that you actually get over this minimum and come down to here. Notice, if you are in the local minimum, you actually have to increase the function to get out. That's the origin of statistical methods with fluctuations in the system. And that's illustrated here by annealing. And annealing is designed uh, to use the thermal motion of particles to jump over false minima. You're in, you're in some state like this. This is a state of some material. And the real answer is this, a much cleaner, actually less pretty state. And to get there, you have to heat this one up and then let it cool gradually. By letting it cool gradually, you're giving it more time to find the minimum, because nature loves minima. It will go to the minimum, but it might get trapped in the local minima if and the criteria for physics is very clear. If the energy, which is K times T, time by T is temperature, absolute temperature, um, if K times T is big enough to jump you over the minima, over the maximum, which are, here we have this local minima. If this thing here on the right units is, is uh, smaller than KT, then thermal motion will jump us over here. And here we have our data science student really trying to optimize. I should point out the quantum computing systems, the so-called D-wave system, it's actually doing annealing. It's doing quantum annealing, which is even more powerful. This is classical annealing. This fellow here, the blacksmith, is a classical annealer. And D-wave has quantum annealing, even better. Here again is a, a plot from around the same time of uh, these loss function at various temperatures. And pointing out as you make the temperature higher and higher, T1 is the highest temperature, you smooth out the energy function. That's because all those little things here, when you get your T such that KT is bigger than this thing, then it's gonna be smoothed out like this is. So here, as KT gets bigger and bigger as we increase the temperature, all these false minima disappear, and we only see the global minima. That's the origin of some of the physics methods of finding or doing optimization. If we look at examples, um, well, the one I always used to do most myself was clustering, where we try and we have a bunch of data in some space, and we're trying to divide them into clusters, which uh, typically minimizes some least square sum of 
the position of the of observation, which may be a particle or maybe just some abstract thing, uh, minus the center or squared. Uh, we actually also work on analysis with the group of cancers called Cresis on snow layer data, and that is data la laid down every year, and um, because of the na nature of, of uh, Time dependent nature of weather, there is a layer between each year, and you, you, by finding number of layers, you um, find out how old the sample is. And that finding the layers is an optimization problem, because you have to draw lines. And generally, it's a good example of, a, of an image processing optimization problem. Dimension reduction is, uh, which I sometimes use MDS, and for deep learning, we use autoencoding. You assign um, positions in some lower dimensional states, three dimensional if you want to visualize it, to minimize the, uh, to make certain that the um, distance in the original space, which is done in some abstract fashion, minus the Euclidean distance for every point pair is minimized. Web search, uh, when you type a search to, to your browser, it finds the web pages which most optimize your happiness, and then your nearest your query. Recommender systems are even better example, because they're the heart of, of the original Amazon recommending books, or the, the heart of Netflix recommending movies. And um, they're trying to find, given your history and other users' uh, ratings, they're trying to find high-rated high, high movies that uh, you're likely to like. Uh, with deep learning, it's all set up as optimizing loss functions. And uh, it's, uh, the heart of deep learning and all what takes all the time is the optimization. And that's what we'll discuss a little later on. Distances in some spaces are pretty important. Because you need a distance to be able to define how near things are. And your optimization is making things as near as possible to each other. Uh, now. We have, uh, when we look at loss functions, we have to continue do the continuous versus discrete. We mentioned that. Then loss functions have particular forms. The most famous for me is chi squared, the sum of squares, uh, observation minus model or squared, summed over all observations. There is a hidden markup model which you could view as a early version of a, of a neural net, which just has a few hidden variables. Uh, for corresponding to the observations, and uh, that's um, and then you have a Markov random field which generalizes that, but it's still not as general as a as a deep learning loss function which has lots and lots of la many layers of hidden layers and many and very complex connections. And in physics we have free energies. That's the energy including the entropy term, which is the kinetic term. And I pointed out how those get smoothed as you go up in temperature. I've already pointed out the greedy algorithms actually should not be dismissed. You should now realize they're greedy, um, and uh, that has consequences. They're not exploring the space as fully as you might. Uh, you typically do greedy algorithms iterations, and uh, at each step you make the iteration that goes down as much as possible. If you think about a hill, there's some, there are, you can move down the hill in many directions. But there's one direction that goes down the fastest. And in uh, stochastic gradient descent, you have a set of small steps which go down the fastest. And if you go down your hill, you can choose how many steps you take. Now, if you're a person, you take a step, then another step, and then you see what happens. Uh, if you're a computer program, that test take, takes too much time. You just take a step. Because you're taking lots of steps and lots of variables, there's not time to second guess them. With a single human going at a slightly slower speed, that's practical. Notice that Wall Street is full of local, local minima. Politics is certainly full of local minima. Um, when somebody from a particular party gets in, and so they're often um, actually globally optimized, but in certain criteria, like a certain class of people or a certain set of criteria get used. 
you change the criteria, they no longer obviously are minima. Well, I should say optimal. Um, well, recommender engines are a particularly good case of, um, of trying to discuss distances. Uh, if you do what's called collaborative filtering, which is the way you the, the, the technique for deciding how to um, uh, pre predict what uh, people should look at, then this, the, one of the formulations, which is called user-based collaborative filtering, then you, uh, you, you have a set of users and a set of items, and we're trying to match the users to the items. So you think of the users as a point in the space of items. So there's a space, if you have a billion items, there's a billion dimension space, and then the user rates items. So he has points in his vector, which are the weights, which means he has a lot of missing points in his vector. So this is not a traditional space. Traditional spaces do not have missing points, because remember, zero does not mean missing. Zero means terrible. So when you rate, so the having so these are interesting vectors which only have some of their components defined, and then there's something called the Pearson coefficient that takes these funny vectors and finds out effectively how near each other. And this type of idea is used continuously by uh, here it says last FM, but Amazon and Netflix essentially use these ideas. Um, okay. So we can also do the opposite, which is item-based collaborative filtering. We can think of the items in a space of users. So a given item is, say, rated by a, a thousand users. So his, its vector would have a thousand entries, which are the ratings for those users. And so here we have a user space vector for each item. And again, we can find, uh, here it's called the cosine measure for historical reasons which is a traditional distance measure, effectively, which tells you how these are, how far these items are apart. Because again, you would expect if a user is looking at, a, if, a, if a viewer watches a movie, and that movie has one of these vectors, then um, if you calculate the distance correctly, so only use the, <coughs> the points in common, where they're both defined with common ratings, then uh, uh, points in the space which, are, which have similar uh, are similar ratings, which uh, which is what the cosine measure uh, abstracts, are likely to be useful to view. All right, the last uh, slide on distances in funny spaces does the other uh, method for recommender systems, which are content-based recommender systems. Now we have a property space, which might be a color, um, a size, um, age, in, age of interest, and things like that. Then you can represent each item in a space of properties, or it's a space of content. And then, then you're trying to find similar items. And so that's um, items that are near each other in this space. And um, that's again used by Amazon, Netflix, and uh, Pandora invented this effect under the name, fancier name, the Music Genome. I think it was the foundation of their busy business. Um, well, do we need real spaces? Well, AI involves points. We have events when we're looking at physics and trying to find the Higgs. We have users or items when we're doing recommender engines. We have uh, words and books and documents. And um, you can think of all these thing, things we're looking at as points. They're in some space, which is sometimes called a bag. And then we want to look at, say, the set of all documents. Uh, which might be characterized by the um, occurrence of words. So the, um, they could be defined in the space of words. And, um, and um, we then need to see if they're similar, and we need to find a distance between them. And uh, this distance, we'd certainly like it always to be positive. We'd like it to be symmetric. But there is this fancy Euclidean 
property of Euclidean spaces that uh, DAB plus DBC is greater than DAC. That's the so-called triangle inequality is not true. So these fake spaces do not have the triangle inequality. And that is actually not a big deal as far as I know. It's just a, it's a property of Euclidean spaces, which probably leads to lots of useful features, but it is not essential. All right, uh, most, for instance, uh, deep learning is what I call here continuous optimization. Namely, it's a, um, you have a function, that function is a functional variable, uh, it depends on variables, those variables can, are continuous. Um, and then we will next go on to discrete. But uh, when you have continuous, then you get these uh, plots like this. And here we actually somehow have sketched on here the path to the minima. So here is a path to the minima. And here is a rather clearer path to here. And you can see how it's done by a set of little, sets, little uh, steps which actually go in the local uh, direction of steepest descent. So steepest descent, um, you can't do a steepest descent to the um, to the true minimum here, um, from here, because the steepest descent direction is in this direction. So what you do is you do a whole, you just do an iteratively a set of steepest descents. Each time you go in the steepest descent direction, and they say if you don't get trapped in the local minima, you will actually make it. And in the case of um, Deep learning, we actually do lots and lots of these uh, steps, huge numbers. And each time we do it uh, sort of statistically in the right, you know, the right property, because we just use a sample of the data. And by we do that partly to speed it up, but also uh, this gives us lots of little steps. And by having lots of little steps, we have a much better chance of getting over these. Uh, getting through these fake minima and uh, roaring off to um, the real minima. Notice actually in physics uses a different way of doing statistics. It uses the statistics of smoothing the function, which is the potential energy, uh, with the thing you usually want to minimize is essentially the potential energy of the physics problem, with the, with the kinetic energy terms, which uh, which uh, have typical energy, as I mentioned, kT or kT over two, and um, those are those are used to smooth out the problems. And so each of, all of these methods actually use statistics in some sense to get the right answer. And we have we have um, algorithms which are these the ones here. These last three are the ones I used to use before I did deep learning. They're the classic uh, ways of solving. Uh, Nonlinear optimization problems, and they're still probably valuable. I'm not quite certain when they work and deep learning doesn't work, but deep learning can do some of the cases I used to do here. Um, and these tend to use, uh, they can use either first derivative, they can use function evaluation. Most of these use second order methods, smack off explicitly. And Levenberg McQuart is also second order. And uh, so these are basically second order methods. And for the problems we used to do in those days, they were not so big that you couldn't use second order methods and calculate a, a second order, a second order um, differential for the loss function. Um, if we look at um, discrete optimization, then actually deep learning is good at discrete optimization. It learns, uh, so for instance, whether um, a particular picture is a picture of the letter Z, letter A, B, C, D, E through Z. So that's a, disc, a discrete um, optimization, because we're just trying to find uh, a discrete value, namely uh, one of 26 possibilities for each of the uh, pictures we have. Genetic algorithms are perhaps more um, important, although they're not as powerful and revolutionary as deep learning. And they sort of use the principle which is done by evolution. So 
Convolutional neural nets actually use the method the brain does. So it's equivalent to a neural net in the brain. Genetic algorithms are, are basically evolution. So they have a, a set of, if you have a function you want to minimize by genetic algorithm, you form a bunch of function values, and that's your population. And then you're going to try to take that population and use the survival of the fittest method. Um, and you are, and you often tend to use this with discrete problems because it's much more natural with discrete problems, though it's not essential. So you have um, a set of points; they're the possible solutions. You have their fitness, which is the value of the objective function or loss function, and then you change the population. You delete things in, according to rules. You keep things according to rules, and then you mutate them. Which you can do by, like in the way nature does, by you know, cosmic rays wiping out a genome or something. I mean, a, D, a DNA uh, unit or crossover, which is equivalent to, to, to marriage. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, giving birth, where um, mating rather, where um, you take two vectors and then you merge them together and take, say, the part of this part of one vector and this part of the other vector. And you take this, so you take a large population, and you iterate this population, and at the end you take the best value. And when you do deleting, you're not going to be deleting the ones that are doing well. This method only uses function evaluation, there's no derivatives being needed, and so it actually can run a lot faster than some of the other algorithms. Uh, finally, we'll talk about heuristics. Here is Wikipedia's definition of heuristics, which are these ad hoc algorithms which you do, which are kind of which are application dependent, and they uh, are not exact, and they they sacrifice something, and then usually the exactness in order to get a method which can be uh, run reasonably fast and gets reasonably good answers, um, because actually when you think about data, data is not precise. So you don't actually need the exact optimal for most sets of data, you just need a good optimal. And that's what heuristics are aimed at. They are aimed at good answers, not exact answers. And there's this concept of computer science called MP hardness, which essentially says it's an exponentially hard problem. But if you actually compare the property of MP hardness with, the, with how hard it is to solve, the many MP hard problems are actually pretty easy to have a good heuristic, and um, so heuristics are very, very important. And I would actually consider the the constraints of being a, being or not being MP hard are not as important as you might have thought. Thank you. So that's the end of this lesson, and uh, let's get on with the next lesson.